Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us and welcome to the first Regional Policy Council meeting of 2022. The Regional Policy Council, or RPC, as we refer to it, um, is one of um, MHA's programs we're very, very proud of, and I'm Debbie Plotnick. I'm the Executive Vice President for State and Federal Advocacy here at Mental Health America nationally. And I really uh, wanna extend the biggest welcome but I want to everybody who's joining us today. And I wanna start by thanking the people who make it possible for us to be here today and for all of our regional policy council meetings. And that's our industry partners. Um, I'm going to name them because they're really important partners to us. Alkermes, Janssen, Myriad, Neurocrine, Otska, Pfizer, Sage, Takeda Lundbeck, and Teva. Thank you to our industry partners. I want to also begin with just a little bit of housekeeping that we always have to do when we're virtual. So I want to let everybody know that this meeting is being recorded. It will be available for download. Give us a little bit of time to do some editing. We'll have it for you soon. And everyone who's registered will get an email telling them when the uh, video is ready for them. Um, all the slides that you will see today being presented, plus the um, uh, pieces of legislation and fact sheets, all of that will be available to you also for download. Um, one thing that I do ask is that folks please do mute themselves. There will be some opportunity for interaction, but at this point, please do mute yourself. Some of our guests will be joining us live for Q&A, but let's just get started. Um, we really miss everybody in person. We're so excited to be here today. Unfortunately, we won't be able to do what we usually do for the Governor's Award, which is have some birthday cake for MHA and share some nibblies and some Thing to think. We really do miss you, but we're so excited that today we have two outstanding governors to thank with the 2022 Governor's Leadership Awards going to Colorado Governor Jared Polis and Arizona Governor Doug Ducey. Before we hear from the governors and uh, we hear from our affiliates who are going to introduce them, we have a welcome message from MHA's president and CEO, Schroeder Stribling. Hello, everyone. Along with Debbie, I'm so pleased to welcome you to our 2022 Regional Policy Council and our celebration of the Governor's Leadership Award. This past June, I stepped into the role as President and CEO at Mental Health America after three decades of a career in social work, mental health, and nonprofit leadership. It is an honor to serve in this role with so many passionate and dedicated colleagues and advocates, such as those of you here today. You are all vital voices in our efforts to combat the most significant national mental health crisis of our times. Here at Mental Health America, our work is driven by a commitment to promote mental health as a critical part of overall wellness. This includes advocating for universal prevention efforts, promoting early intervention for those at risk, elevating promising practices like integrated and collaborative care, addressing the need for equitable access to culturally relevant mental health care, and advancing the use of peer supports. Meeting people where they are, meeting the need at the speed of the need, and lifting up the hope and promise of recovery for all who seek it are our mission imperatives. Our Regional Policy Council is one of MHA's signature programs, bringing timely policy and advocacy information to our affiliates and partners, and honoring elected officials who have demonstrated outstanding leadership on mental health to the citizens of their states. Today, we are proud to honor two such outstanding leaders, Governor Doug Ducey of Arizona and Governor Jared Polis of Colorado. You will be hearing more about their accomplishments shortly, 
And let me say in advance just how delighted we are to be able to lift up these examples of innovative and committed leadership. Governors Polis and Ducey now join a distinguished list of past honorees, including Governor Tom Wolf of Pennsylvania, Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, Governor Charlie Baker of Massachusetts, all of whom were honored last year, and previous honorees, including Governor Mike DeWine of Ohio, Governor Gina Raimondo of Rhode Island, Governor Pete Ricketts of Nebraska, Governor Jay Inslee of Washington, and Governor Scott Walker of Wisconsin. You'll hear more shortly about why Governors Polis and Ducey have been selected for this recognition by members of the MHA Affiliate Network. Mo Keller from Mental Health Colorado, who is one of four leaders of the Regional Policy Council, will introduce Governor Polis, and Matthew Moody, board chair from MHA of Arizona, will introduce Governor Ducey. Thank you again for your participation here today at MHA's Regional Policy Council. And even more so, thank you to each and every one of you for your work every day to promote mental health, well being, and recovery for all Americans. Thank you. Mental Health Colorado would like to thank Governor Polis for his dedication and leadership in behavioral health. Colorado's behavioral health system is at a critical juncture and the governor's strength in rejecting an inadequate status quo and his openness to reform systemic barriers to care are greatly appreciated. In 2019, Governor Polis established a behavioral health task force to study and make recommendations on how best to improve the delivery of services to any Coloradan in need of behavioral health services. Mental Health Colorado is very grateful to the governor for signing into law many of our bills and other bills that we have championed, including the broadening of career possibilities for peer support specialists, designing an alternative transportation system for individuals in crisis, establishing restrictions on the use of solitary confinement in jails for individuals with significant mental health conditions and for signing the 988 law, which creates the suicide prevention lifeline in our state. We will be ready to go in July of 2022. In addition, the governor has set aside $550 million in his budget for behavioral health needs, including inpatient, residential, step-down, and permanent housing option. He is also planning on leveraging those dollars by working with local governments, to disentangle mental health and criminal justice, and to address substance use, depression, and reduce the suicide rate. We know as Mental Health Colorado that the governor will continue to be a leader in creating transformational change in Colorado. We applaud the current work of the governor and his administration to create structural changes to our system. We would like to thank the governor for his past accomplishments in behavioral health, and we look forward to seeing future transformational change under his leadership. Thank you, Governor Polis. Hello, everyone. I wish I could be with you in person, but it's a pleasure to join you virtually at Mental Health America's Regional Policy Meeting. I want to begin by thanking Mental Health America, especially Senior Vice President for State and Federal Advocacy, Debbie Plotnick, and of course, my friend, Mo Keller of Mental Health Colorado. Uh, both of you have contributed so much to improving the well-being of our fellow Coloradans, and I appreciate your strong advocacy. These last two years have been tough on everybody. That's why we're committed to working with community leaders like you, legislators in the General Assembly, to really get to the root of Colorado's mental and behavioral health challenges. And there's a historic opportunity to do just that. We know there's a lot of work to do, and we're dedicated to really putting people first. That's why we created the Behavioral Health Task Force when I first took office. And thanks to the Behavioral Health Task Force recommendations and the work of legislators, we now have a new Behavioral Health Administration to help streamline the behavioral health system and put patients first, ensuring care for everybody who needs it, where they need it, when they need it. 
In addition to the Behavioral Health Administration, we've expanded telehealth services, private insurance coverage for yearly mental health screenings, helped get Colorado children the mental health support they need. I want to thank Representative Michelson Janae for the new I Matter program, free counseling and mental health services for youth. I was proud to invite Melissa Mead and her son Grady to my state of the state address this year, a few weeks ago, to highlight the success of the I Matter program. When Grady, like so many kids across our state, needed mental health support, Melissa first ran up against the harsh reality of a hard to navigate and bureaucratic system. Until she found imattercolorado.org. And she got her appointment within a few minutes. A couple of days later, he was scheduled for an appointment. And this is why we do the work we do. And thanks to the historic funding from the American Rescue Plan, we have the opportunity to build on our success, to work together to really transform and upgrade Colorado's response to the behavioral health needs of our residents. Thank you to the Mental Health America and Mental Health Colorado uh, for this award and for all the advocacy that you do. Hello, I'm Matthew Moody. As board president of Mental Health America of Arizona, I'm pleased to nominate Governor Doug Ducey to receive Mental Health America's 2022 Governor's Leadership Award in recognition of his commitment to mental health. Governor Ducey continues to demonstrate that he is a mental health champion, leading on issues like mental health parity, providing 8 million for youth behavioral health services, signing into law numerous youth mental health education and suicide prevention initiatives, and allocating half a million dollars in coronavirus relief funds to organizations offering mental health support services. With multiple tiers of oversight, Arizona residents also benefit from an independent mental health crisis system that is considered best practice in our country. This includes free crisis line, mobile team, and crisis stabilization services 24-7. On behalf of Mental Health America of Arizona and Mental Health America National, we thank you, Governor Ducey, for your leadership on these important issues and congratulate you on this well-deserved honor. This is Governor Ducey. Thank you to Mental Health America for recognizing Arizona for our work to protect and preserve the mental health of Arizonans. This has been a priority of mine since I took office and it has only become more pressing these past two years. The health impacts of the pandemic extend far beyond COVID-19. Americans across the country have suffered from anxiety, depression, burnout, substance abuse, and far too much more. It only stresses the importance of investing in mental health resources and getting Arizonans the care they need. In 2020, I was eager to sign a bill which requires health insurers to provide the same level of benefits for mental and substance use treatment that's provided for medical care. And last year, I signed legislation that expands telehealth coverage across our state. This will allow more Arizonans to get the care they need sooner, no matter where they live. We're also making sure our kids get the special attention they deserve. Distance learning has made them fall behind, not just academically, but socially and behaviorally too. That's why we've worked hard to keep kids in the classroom with their teachers, mentors, and friends. It's also why in 2020, I partnered with the legislature to establish the Children's Behavioral Health Services Fund. We've allocated $8 million to this fund so uninsured and underinsured students can get the care they need without concern for the costs. We're going to continue to take actions that support mental health resources and services in Arizona. And leaders like Mental Health America will be a critical partner in that effort. I wanna thank President and CEO Schroeder Stribling, the board and the entire team at Mental Health America for your hard work and advocacy on this important issue. We have more work to do, but I'm confident that together we can improve the mental health of Arizonans and Americans across the country. Thank you again and God bless.
Congratulations once again to Governor Polis and Governor Ducey. We thank them for their hard work and for all the state legislation happening in their states as well. Now we're going to, to really dig into the meat of the matter today. We're gonna think big not locally at all levels of government. We're going to hear an overview of federal public policy from MHA's Chief Public Policy Officer, Mary Gilliberti. Then we're going to hear about an amazing piece of legislation that will be introduced in the next couple of weeks by Representative, uh, California Representative Cardenas and his co-sponsors. We're gonna hear about that from a wonderful congressional fellow in his office, Dr. Eric Rafla Guan, and he will be telling us all the details of this piece of legislation. We're going to then come down to the state's level, and we're going to hear from the National Association of State Mental Health Directors from A.J. Walker, who's a good friend of MHA, and he's going to tell us about different initiatives happening in the states on many of the issues that we care about as we sit at the precipice of being able to do some wonderful things. We're then going to come down to the county levels and we're going to hear from Jonah Cunningham. And Jonah is the new president and CEO of the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental uh, Disability Directors. He's also the president and CEO of the National Association for Rural Mental Health. And after we hear from Jonah, he's going to join us for a few minutes of live Q&A. So please be thinking about what you might want to be asking Jonah and please put it in the chat. And I'll be back to tell you about some more states issues after we hear about federal, states, county, and rural. Hello everyone, I'm so excited to join you today to talk about federal advocacy. I've entitled my presentation, Hurry Up and Wait, Federal Advocacy 2022, because that was one of my favorite sayings when I worked on Capitol Hill. It felt like we were always rushing to get things done, and then we were waiting to get the final policy through the process. And you'll hear a little bit about that as we move forward. So show me the money. Every year, you know, the federal government allocates resources for all of its programs. And fiscal year 2022 appropriations is no different. There was a bill in the House in the summer of 2021. And then there was a Senate Democratic bill and report in October of 21. But we didn't get a final bill. Instead, we got what's known in the business as a CR or a continuing resolution. What does that mean? That means that the government continues at the same funding levels until Congress finally gets that bill done. So after February 18th, Congress has to do something. It's either going to pass the new bill or it's going to continue at the old funding levels. Why do we care which one it does? Well, you see all those dollar bills in the air? There's a lot of mental health advocacy increases in the FY22 bill, thanks to a lot of you and the advocacy that you've done in telling Congress how important mental health is. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples, but there are lots. One is the mental health community block grant. So that money goes to states and then to local communities, to many of the organizations that some of you work at. And that money would be more than doubled in the 22 bill uh, in the Senate and the House bills, but we got to get them passed to see that money um, get over the finish line. There's also additional resources for suicide prevention, for a certified community behavioral health centers, um, increases for school-based mental health, a lot of money there, $800 million for more social workers and psychologists in schools. We'd love to see those resources to expanding school-based workforce, but again, we have to get a bill done. What mental health and substance use dollars were previously allocated? Well, there were some bills that did pass in the past, and we had December 2020 and March 2021, significant resources in both mental health and substance use going out to states 
and then through the states to local communities. So look in your states, there may still be resources that are being allocated right now at that state and local level. Build back better, and I put there build back broken, because you might remember and have heard about this build back better bill. It was a bill that had a lot of different pieces and was supposed to be passed through a process called reconciliation, but you have to have 50 senators in the Senate agree to it, and they couldn't get to that threshold. So now there's some conversation about breaking it up, and build back broken, uh, and having different pieces. So what are some of the pieces that we, as the mental health community, really care about? One is increased Medicaid match for home and community-based services. You remember, a Medicaid match is when you put uh, the state money with the federal money. And this would give more federal match, more federal dollars to states to expand these programs and make them better. And that includes behavioral health services. Penalties for non-compliance with parents. Right now, if an insurance plan doesn't comply with parity, the Department of Labor cannot issue penalties. So having that um, power would really help. Certified community behavioral health clinic expansion, getting more uh, behavioral health services out there. Maternal health, including mental health, both coverage and resources. An expansion of Medicaid to cover people prior to discharge from incarceration. We'd love to see that happen so the right services can get in place and help people to do well as they make that difficult sometimes transition. So we'll see what happens with that Build Back Better bill. It may go forward in pieces, it may not go forward at all. One other area that's important in that bill is the child uh, tax credit. And the reason that's important is it brings children out of poverty, which we all know affects mental health. So opportunities, what we call must pass legislation. So when I worked on Capitol Hill, we would call these the trains. Why do we call them a train? Because we wanted to hook our policy to the train that we knew was going to get through the Congress. Because as you can tell from everything I've presented so far, it's not easy to get something through Congress. There is a lot of process. So if a train has to go through and you can ride that, you can get your policies in. So what are some of those trains? Annual appropriations. They have to do something to keep the government going and keep it funded. Second, the Prescription Drug User Fee Act, otherwise known as PDUFA. It is up for reauthorization this year, it generates substantial revenue for reviewing drug discovery and treatments. So it was likely it will go through. So that's another one. What are some other opportunities? Well, the 21st Century Cures Act uh, was passed in 2016. It's going to probably be reauthorized and could go along with FIDUFA. One of the things that MHA is pushing is a neuroscience center of excellence at FDA. And there's a bill there, Senate 3427. And we think that would be great. There's an oncology one now, and it's really helped with coordination and, and engaging with stakeholders, including people who have these conditions. So we're pushing for that. The Senate Finance Mental Health Bill. So uh, the chair and the ranking member have said of that committee that they want to do a bill this year, which is exciting. And then SAMHSA reauthorization, that's the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration. That's the agency in the federal government that provides many of the grants for mental health and substance use. And the House Energy and Commerce Committee has said they want to work on reauthorizing all of those programs. So that's another opportunity. Senate finance areas of interest, they have broken out into work groups, and I don't think this will surprise many of you, strengthening that workforce, increasing integration, coordination, and access, ensuring parity, furthering the use of telehealth, and improving access to behavioral health care for you children and young people. So what are some of MHA's priorities for that Senate finance bill? Well, we want to increase access to peer support services in the Medicare program. Many of you are familiar with peers being used in Medicaid, but not so much in Medicare. So our bill as Senate 2144, House 2767, would begin that process by covering peer support in integrated primary care settings. Increase of primary care integration generally in behavioral health care and access to integrated youth behavioral health care is another priority. Improving standards for crisis care and access to crisis care by all payers. Generally, Medicaid pays for crisis care, but other payers do not. And even within Medicaid, there's work to be done to have more coverage of crisis care and standards. 
That bill is Senate 1902. There is a very comprehensive bill that includes a lot of those provisions, but even goes further in the House. And Eric from Representative Cardenas's office is going to be participating in this RPC, and you will hear from him more on that bill to come. Other MHA priorities, continuing a high level of funding for the mental health block grant and increasing uh, some of those resources, securing them for prevention. We want to get upstream. And that's uh, the theme of our second priority too, working with the CDC to think about mental health as public health. So how do we get more resources for a coordinating center there, for other programs at CDC to bring us upstream uh, and really take that public health approach to mental health, particularly for youth. Focusing on equity, uh, Senate Bill 1795, the Pursuing Equity and Mental Health Act is an MHA priority. That bill would increase research into mental health disparities, as well as work on strengthening a diverse workforce. Secure additional Medicaid guidance from CMS on areas of importance to us, school health financing, crisis services, peer support. We will have a big focus this year on 988 implementation. Now you may be thinking, what is 988? Well, there's a new three digit number that's coming where instead of dialing 911 when you have a mental health crisis, you'll be able to dial 988 and get a behavioral health response. And so we are all working at the federal, state, local level to make sure that the promise of 988 is realized and anybody calling that number can get the best help um, possible. And we can keep this in the behavioral health area and not in law enforcement. So what has to happen? We need to see an expansion of payment for those local crisis stabilization and response services. Um, and you have some examples there, certified community behavioral health clinics, increased Medicaid match, increased financing for all of this, workforce expansion needed, and appropriations in fiscal year 23. So we're about to start the 23 process. I know I, I already told you 22 hasn't even been finished, but we're going to be starting 23. And that includes the lifeline, call centers, a public health campaign. People have to know about this, right? Uh, coordinating centers, block grant set asides for crisis. Um, you know, and again, I mentioned the clinics and the workforce, everything that's needed, especially a diverse workforce. We really need to focus on that uh, to ensure equity as we move forward. You'll see there on the bottom, we're going to be circulating these slides, so don't worry about uh, copying anything down. But we have a Q&A document on 988. If you're still scratching your head going, what is she talking about? What is this 988? Um, we have a bunch of documents there that can help you get up to speed. SAMHSA has a new website and fact sheet uh, for people to use. But it is an exciting opportunity. By July of 2022, all carriers, all telephone carriers have to make 988 available. So if you call on your phone 988, you will get access to the Lifeline uh, and the local call centers. And then if you need additional assistance, the real question is what's going to be there for you? So we're working at the federal level to make sure those resources and coordination is available. And here is our contact information for Mental Health America and my email is right there. And I wanna thank all of you for the advocacy that you do on federal issues and of course state and local issues as well, but we really rely on you. Those increases that you saw in this presentation, the committees taking up these issues, that's because they are hearing from folks like you about how important mental health is. So thank you for all the advocacy. You will see alerts. I urge you to take action whenever you see our alerts come out and we'll be reaching out to some of you when we do meetings on the Hill. But thank you for all that you do. We really appreciate it. And we look forward to working together to keep up that federal advocacy and secure the resources needed to have an equitable and effective mental health system for everyone. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Sorry I cannot be with you in person, but I want to thank Mental Health America for all the great work that you do for individuals and families across the country. My name is Eric Rothley Wan. I'm a psychiatrist and here today on behalf of US Congressman Tony Cardenas, who represents the San Fernando Valley in California. Um, and I'm excited to talk to you about one of our bills, the 988 Implementation Act. 
So the 988 Implementation Act. So some of you may have heard of 988, but for those of you who may have not, and also a review for all of us, um, starting in July of this year, 988 will serve as a nationwide 24-7 calling code anywhere in the country for individuals and families who need emergency mental health assistance. Um, this is something that we've needed for a long time. And a concern that we have now is when you call 988, our service is going to be there to help those who need them. And so what the Congressman and I have been working on is the 988 Implementation Act, which will ensure that people who call 988 can get help. And what does that help look like? So we'll go through that here quickly. So on the left, you have someone who's in crisis. It could be that person. It could be that person themselves, a family member, a friend, even a bystander. And they may call 988. And if the 988 operator is not able to handle it on the phone, and ideally that person will have some knowledge and of, of, of mental health issues and maybe some counseling background and ability to triage. Um, and so if they're not able to handle it on the phone, they'll be able to send a mobile dispatch or mobile crisis team, which is typically a mental health specialist and a, and a nurse medic or EMT. And if that mobile crisis team, team isn't able to handle that on the ground, then they can get the individual in need to a crisis facility. And that idea of a crisis facility is a, is a quiet, safe, supportive home-like environment where that person in need can get taken out of that crisis-inducing situation. And really importantly, it's not an emergency room. It's not a hospital. Again, it's, a, it's a designed to be a really short-term um, home-like environment to get that person back on their feet and connected to resources so we don't just send them back into the same crisis. And as you can see from, from the numbers here, the, the pilot programs that have implemented this have had really good outcomes data as well as actual cost savings. Um, because it's not only better for the person to assist them before they get to a, a place where they need the emergency room, but, but also cheaper to do that as well. And so the purpose of our act is to develop a comprehensive outline for bipartisan congressional support for implementing this 988 system. Um, we're hoping to introduce it next month in, in February, and we're pairing this with a bipartisan congressional 988 and crisis services task force um, to continue the momentum of this year as we know that more work will be needed. Um, some of the guiding principles for, the, for this bill, so to really develop though, not just 988, but the full continuum of care as envisioned as in those guidelines, which really call for someone to call, someone to come and, and somewhere to go. We update relevant statutes, include 988 and crisis care. Is, is a lot of these are new terms and, and don't appear in previous mental health or public health legislation. Um, we have an eye to research and evidence collection and also workforce investment and development. We know that workforce shortages are real and we have a mental health workforce shortage even before um, the pandemic. And also very importantly, we wanted to provide guidance and funding for local services to be able to be implemented and retain the flexibility for communities to develop solutions that work for them. I wanted also to acknowledge the work by other members of Congress um, who introduced this bill, which we have worked with them to include the text in, in our bill as well. And so this was the Behavioral Health Crisis Services Expansion Act. And there are identical texts both in the House and Senate. And so this bill does a couple of important things. One is it sets some standards for these crisis services, um, but also importantly, it provides coverage. And so what I mean by that is right now, there really is not a way for service providers to get reimbursed for providing crisis services, which really means that there's not an incentive to do it or to invest in these services. Um, and so what this bill does is it requires insurers, both public and private health insurers, to cover crisis services and to require benefit. And we really feel that this is an important step forward in the parity of mental health with other types of health services, as well as necessary for developing the infrastructure for these. And again, if, if uh, an ambulance picks you up and picks you to a hospital, those get covered by insurance, if, if you have insurance, of course. And, and if you don't, then, then you're sort of out of luck. But the, um, this bill would require the insurers to cover mental health similarly to they do for other types of conditions. And so our bill has a number of provisions. Um, one, and this is organized by the agency that they um, are targeted towards. So it 
authorizes and funds since this, this is in, in SAMHSA, a, a behavioral health crisis coordinating office. And so this would develop the research and coordination technical assistance um, for these 988 services and implementation. Um, for the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline, we continue the funding of that with additional resources for populations with, with special accessibility needs or other unique concerns. For the first time, we federally fund many of the regional and local lifeline call centers, which will be crucial to carrying out the, the 988 goal. And some of you may be familiar with the mental health block grant. And so our bill continues that forward as well with a 10% set aside for crisis services. We also have a mental health crisis response partnership pilot program. And so this is pilot funding for programs to create or enhance existing mobile crisis teams. And again, those mobile crisis teams are those non-law enforcement, but rather clinical specialists that are really um, trained and equipped for the job. And so we know that there are a number of ways that communities have been developing their own flavors or, or variations on what mobile crisis team looks like that's a, a good fit for them. And we really wanted to be able to have opportunities for these communities to continue this, as well as opportunities to collect data and see what models really work and, and we, should, we should be applying everywhere. Um, for the Health Resources Services Administration, we have capital development grants. It is actual building money for physical buildings, whether it's a call center or a crisis receiving center, um, as well as expanding the behavioral health workforce training programs. And so this expands a currently existing programs to include crisis professionals and, and paraprofessionals as um, eligible for many of these programs, whether it's loan forgiveness, scholarships, grant money. We are also looking at the possibility of adding additional workforce funding money as well. For CMS, um, we have an extension of the FMAP. What the FMAP is, is the, the state and the government, federal government, come to an agreement on how much of reinsurance insurance coverage the, the state pays versus the federal government. And again, this is for um, insurance plans administered by CMS. So this is typically Medicare and Medicaid. And so this would make the share that the federal government pays for all crisis services 85%. And so we think that this will really um, support areas that are really trying to develop those crisis services. And for those that are on the fence, um, hopefully incentivize them to, to develop some of these services. For IMD amendments, we don't want um, an IMD payment prohibition to get in the way of the ability for states and cities to provide services. And so we define that for crisis centers, which are not to exceed a stay of 72 hours, um, that they are not affected by the IMD payment prohibition. And, and lastly, we include the text from another bill, the Excellence in Mental Health and Addiction Treatment Expansion Act, which expands the 10 state Medicaid demonstration for CCBHCs. CCBHCs are certified community behavioral health centers. And what really they are is community health clinics. If they're able to provide a, a certain number of services, and, and this list has been defined by SAMHSA, then they get additional um, benefits. And we have found that these programs and, and crisis services are, are one of those required services. And, and we have found and, and heard from many across the country that these clinics have been doing an excellent job in providing some of these crisis services in those communities. And so this bill and this text in our bill um, would allow any state to participate because right now only 10 states are able to get access to these. And so this would allow any state that wishes to participate um, give them the ability to do so. And so that's all the slides that I have. And so I want to, to thank you again today for, for your work um, with, with mental health and, and all the, the issues that, that you all are working on around it, as well as this opportunity to bring this bill before you. I um, would ask if this is something that you feel is we need. And, and I would say that that is something we need that you call your local federal representatives about this. So your members of Congress, whether in the House or Senate, both to educate them on the need for 988 and crisis services and why it's so important to you and your families and, and our communities, as well as specifically for the 988 Implementation Act. I will say some of the things that we've heard from 
others on the Hill, which really concern us is that, well, we should just wait and see what happens in July before we do anything more on it. And that really concerns us because right now there's not been much federal support for the development of 988 and these crisis services. And this wait and see approach without providing the necessary support we think is not only inappropriate, but really going to lead to a lot of preventable harm. So again, that if uh, you're able to, the ask is to, to call your, your members of Congress and in the House and the Senate to educate them on why 988 is so important, and also to add in a word about why 988 implementation and the provisions in our 988 Implementation Act will help move us forward. So thank you again, and I hope you have a good rest of your evening. And uh, hello, good day, and uh, my name is um, Aaron Walker. I am the Policy Manager for the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, and I want to thank uh, Mental Health America for inviting me to come and speak to you today about uh, what states are doing to think big and act locally with their mental health services and programming. The National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors, otherwise known as NASHVID, uh, represents uh, the State Mental Health Commissioner uh, from all 50 states, uh, District of Columbia, and six territories. Uh, they are responsible for the public mental health service delivery system in all, all states and territories. And NASHVID really works with states, federal partners, and stakeholders to promote wellness, recovery, resiliency, um, for individuals with mental health conditions and co-occurring mental health and substance related disorders. Um, we began a, a Beyond, Bed, Beyond Beds initiative in 2017, where NASHBIT has been really focusing on developing that robust continuum of care. And um, now really with an emphasis on 988 and crisis services to divert individuals with uh, mental illness from um, jails and of course unnecessary emergency room visits and with the establishment of the crisis system, um, they, we can help uh, individuals receive the appropriate level of care that they need, taking the pressure off higher end services. Uh, you'll see a link here at the bottom. We do a series of uh, technical assistance coalition assessment papers every year that's funded by SAMHSA. And that has been where our Beyond Beds initiative has grown from. And you'll see a link here that leads you to uh, some of the past series of papers. So states really are focused right now, of, of course, building the, the, the continuum of care, but also um, really looking at um, how the pandemic has exacerbated the effects on mental health for all, and, and especially the now the need for high quality crisis services is, is really at, a halt, at an all time high. Um, the crisis services that states are trying to implement um, they're using the national guidelines, which you see here at the bottom, uh, a link to that document where it helps states understand um, how to uh, organize and, and, and develop the crisis continuum that, that would function and be efficient statewide. The three elements of that crisis system include uh, the crisis call centers, the uh, centrally deployed 24-7 mobile crisis units, and the crisis receiving and stabilization. <clears throat> Excuse me. So with 988 implementation quickly approaching in July, states are really, really focused on, on doing this great work and trying to think big on how they can um, elevate their current system to be able to meet the 988 implementation um, by this July. Now, one of the things that's also been, been evident during the pandemic has been the, the great effect that it's had on, on children. Um, uh, during this uh, pandemic. And so I wanted to highlight kind of the focus of states um, um, has been on developing uh, children's services as well. And, and just wanted to highlight the, the Surgeon General's advisory the, uh, for the need to address uh, the nation's youth mental health crisis um, as it calls for a swift and coordinated response. Um, so I think states are really starting to focus in on this. And I'm gonna give you some examples of, of what states are really doing. So the first is uh, mass support. Uh, this was initiated in May of 2020 to respond to the mental health uh, issues that were raised during the pandemic. Um, the goal of providing support to any individual in need, um, mass support also made a concerted effort to establish a strategic network in school districts across Massachusetts. 
Um, since that time, Mass Support has responded with uh, services to a variety of schools in each of the Department of Mental Health Service areas. And these are really tailored to meet the specific needs reported by the district and its community members. A youth advisory group was convened to inform the specific services math support offers to schools as well. And you'll see a link here for a more uh, detailed information. The next example is uh, Connecticut's uh, mobile crisis intervention services for children and adolescents. Um, this is a statewide community-based and family supportive clinical intervention service uh, for children and adolescents who are experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, the state has defined the differences between a youth uh, and families in crisis versus adults, which I think is very important. Um, this, uh, services are, these services are provided to youth in schools, homes, and emergency departments. Um, also, um, as well as other community settings, such as doctor offices and public libraries. Uh, an episode of care is kept open for up to 45 days. This is for the linkage to the next level of care to occur, as well as they're exploring options to further enable uh, direct care linkages by allowing the uh, mobile crisis clinicians to track open beds and services in real time, which is important, as well as directly schedule and directly admit children and youth to most levels of care. They're also exploring the geo-tracking capabilities, which is also important. Again, here's a link here at the bottom uh, to uh, more detailed information. Also, uh, Thinking Big is Oklahoma's system of care, which provides rapid 24-7 community-based crisis services for children and their families to de-escalate emergencies, as well as to access a comprehensive array of behavioral health uh, treatment and supportive services. Uh, so they, they, they hit all three areas, a place to call a children's team to respond and a place to go for further treatment and support. Uh, they have a centralized call center located in Oklahoma City that's staffed with emergency responder, responders who've been trained in uh, de-escalating and safety planning skills, as well as applied suicide inter intervention skills, active listening, and the ability of local services. Uh, the call center specialists are responsible for expediting the mobile crisis team um, by screening and assessing uh, the presenting issues. And then they enter this uh, information into the OKSOC youth information system where it's immediately available to the mobile response team if dispatch is needed. Um, now all, all mobile teams have a master's level uh, clinician, licensed clinician, uh, to provide on-site face-to-face response or via telehealth within one hour of receipt of referral. Also, if needed, the team can then connect the family with community-based services offered by one of the 12 contracted agencies. If a higher level is required, a process known as community-based authorization can be used. Uh, this is where um, they want to ensure access to a comp comprehensive array of behavioral health treatment, and the team also aids in the discharge process as well as continuation of care and authorization um, of extensions if needed. And again, another uh, link here to more great information on Oklahoma's system. But also Oklahoma is also doing something else very uh, creative and innovative. They are using their transformation, uh, uh, transformation transfer uh, initiative 2020 grant funds that um, is awarded through SAMHSA that NASHBID helps to administer to identify needs among the homeless population um, to purchase tablets to ensure access to services. Uh, they have connected at-risk people with resources already downloaded that's already downloaded on the tablets and crisis specialists that can be reached uh, when in need, as well as law enforcement that can hand the tablet to someone in crisis for them to talk face-to-face -face with a crisis-informed specialist. Uh, to ensure the sustainability, they plan to use evaluation methods and cost savings to justify budget proposals for the future. And if you'd like more information, you feel free to contact Jackie Ship at the email here below. Next. Taking kind of a broader view, looking at um, rural areas, uh, Tennessee's Project Rural Recovery um, is uh, by the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services. The project um, uh, began in uh, December of 2020. 
It's funded through a five-year SAMHSA grant, and it brings um, integrated behavioral and physical health uh, mobile care services to 10 rural counties um, in two recreational vehicles. Uh, the multidisciplinary mobile health team uh, provides an array of services, which include um, individual group counseling, suicide risk screening, um, uh, psychotropic medication dispensing, tobacco, nicotine cessation, primary health screenings, and access to nutrition and housing services, all at no cost to the patient. And um, they also uh, refer patients to community providers for specialty services that cannot be provided on the mobile bus. And again, a link here to a lot more brand information. Next, um, also kind of looking at from a rural perspective, Alaska's Native Tribal um, Health Consortium's Behavioral Health Aid Program. Uh, this is designed to promote behavioral health and wellness in Alaska Native individuals, families, and communities uh, through the use of village-based counselors. Uh, the multi-level provider uh, model trains and educates community uh, members on how to provide therapeutic services and be able to respond to behavioral health crises and support the general mental health and well-being of individual and tribal communities. Uh, the uh, Behavioral Health ABHA is a counselor, health educator, and advocate. They're employed by the regional tribal health organizations, and they seek to achieve a, a balance in the community by integrating their sensitivity to cultural needs with specialized training and behavioral health concerns and approaches to treatment. So the, the, the ANT, ANTHCBHA training center designs and provides training that is required uh, for certification. And once certified, the BHAs are qualified to provide and bill for various Medicaid uh, services based on their level of cert certification. This includes SBIRT, which is screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment, as well as tobacco cessation and individual group and family psychotherapy. And all BHAs are supervised by licensed, uh, licensed clinicians who are able to assist them in connecting individuals to higher levels of care as needed. And again, a link to some more great information. And last but not least is North Dakota's uh, Free Through Recovery Program. This is a community-based behavioral health program that's designed to increase uh, recovery support services to adults age 18 and older involved with the criminal justice system who have behavioral health concerns. This 100% uh, state-funded program partners with local providers through a pay for performance model to facilitate care coordination, uh, as well as assessment, care planning, referrals, and monitoring collaboration with clinical services and probation and parole. Uh, recovery services are also included, such as peer support, supportive housing, educational opportunities, meaningful employment, leisure activities and wellness, family and community, uh, social supports, parenting education, spiritual engagement, nourishment, uh, assistance programs, and other individualized resources. So according to an evaluation completed by the Stanford uh, Computational Policy Lab, evidence did suggest that the uh, free through recovery is a well-managed and constructive new program, but most importantly, um, it corresponds with reduced uh, reincarceration rates for participating individuals. And again, there's a link here at the bottom to another great um, asset uh, that the states are providing and more information. And I would just want to say thank you to Mental Health America again for inviting me to present on these uh, great uh, innovations the states are working on. And feel free to uh, reach out to me anytime. We see my email here. And thank you very much. And I hope you have a great meeting. Thank you, AJ. We have a little change in schedule. Jonah Cunningham is only able to join us until the top of the hour. So I'm gonna have a little chat with Jonah. Thank you so much, our good friend, Jonah Cunningham, for being with us today. And I've seen your video, but folks haven't yet. And um, so I'm gonna ask some questions. Um, one is, Tell us more about how we can do things at the local level, at the county level. 
whose door should we be knocking on? And especially in the rural areas. And we can let everybody know that the staff member you mentioned who's on the board of the Rural Mental Health Association is yours truly. So tell us a little bit before you have to jump off and we'll show your video right after. And we'll also have your resources. Well, thank you, Debbie. Thank you, Mental Health America for having me. Um, I'm sorry, I have to hop off, but to answer your question, mental health doesn't, it's not sector specific, right? So if you're fortunate enough to live in one of the two dozen states that have a county-based system, connecting with your local county-based system, or also your education system, your social, social services, um, law enforcement, public safety, and really just stress their unique perspective on mental health, whether it's crisis response, responding to the youth mental health crisis we're seeing, um, ensuring that if uh, someone with serious mental illness can also get something like social security disability insurance and that it's an easier process perhaps to connect them to housing where I think really it starts on the local level and making your presence known whether it's at a school board meeting whether it's meeting with your local assembly member or state senator um, also just reaching out and learning more about the resources or lack of resources uh, being provided to individuals in your area. Jonah. Thank you for being with us. I know you have to run. Tell us just a tiny bit more before you have to hop off in one minute about rural areas and about some of the special um, issues that they face in terms of distance and space and resources. Yeah. So th there's a overall a behavioral health shortage uh, for providers, right? For rural areas, it's doubly hit. Um, there have been other ways to try to supplement this, whether it's through telehealth or some unique programming through, for example, the uh, Department of Agriculture. Um, they have certain um, programs providing resources for agricultural workers. And while those are great and piecemeal, we're also seeing this other current of hospital closures, even pharmacy closures as well. So it's hard to get your prescriptions from, from your local pharmacy if they're, you know, they uh, don't meet their overhead. So we're really aware where it, some of the issues don't necessarily touch mental health, but they would impact the delivery of mental health, things like rural broadband, um, which we're keeping a, a very close eye on. And some states are really investing in, given some of the uh, COVID relief funds. So rural areas is a very unique challenge, but there's also unique opportunities as well, where we see uh, a lot of... Um, satisfaction, there's a closer knit community. So there's oftentimes a closer support network, um, which can also sometimes reemphasize stigma, but also allow for that support when someone needs and falls on hard times. Jonah, we thank you for your presence today, for your flexibility, and we're going to run that terrific video you gave us. Thank, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, Jonah. Okay, we're going to hear more from Jonah by video right now. Hi, everyone. I'm Jonah C. Cunningham from the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors and the National Association of Rural Mental Health. And I'm very excited to join you here today. Now, let's do a little bit of housekeeping. So NACBID, or the National Association of County Behavioral Health and Developmental Disability Directors, we are the voice of local authorities in Washington, D.C. So first off, a little background. Um, NACBID was founded, the simple story is, after the deinstitutionalization movement in the 1960s, many states established a county-based system so individuals could be treated in their communities. And this continues in about two dozen states. Now, our association represents these organizations who serve people with behavioral health or intellectual and developmental and or developmental disabilities. And given our unique perspective, we are an affiliate of the National Association of Counties. Now, similarly, the other organization and the other hat I wear is the National Association for Rural Mental Health. Now, this membership is broader than NACBIDS. It includes consumers, family members, practitioners, administrators, educators, researchers, policymakers, and students, and one uh, Mental Health America staffer. Um, the unifying force is a focus on rural concerns and a commitment to rural people and those that serve them. Now, like NACBID is an affiliate of NACO, NARM is an affiliate of NACBID, meaning that NARM members get the benefits of NACBID membership as well. 
Now, with that housekeeping aside, let's talk about the role of counties. And we use kind of the seven P's uh, framework. So planner, policy developer, preventer, protector, partner, purchaser, provider, just don't say it seven times fast. But first, county behavioral health authorities are planners. They're charged with identifying the current and future environments in which they operate, develop strategic plans to address any barriers and gaps, and of course are constricted by the resources they have. Secondly, there are policy developers. So they often research, analyze, and articulate the impacts of rules and regulations that are both passed and also proposed. And where possible, they strive to be preventers by coordinating health promotion programming. They are protectors of health and safety of individuals through their managing of crisis support and mobile crisis services. They also work in partnership with the criminal justice system to divert those with mental illness or substance use disorder from that, those systems. They also partner with their communities in other sectors like public health, education, criminal justice, social services, as well as private and other governmental organizations. Of course, they're purchasers of services through their networks of community-based traditional and non-traditional services and supports. And lastly, they're providers through their direct care for those in their communities. Now, we kind of have that framework. Let's talk about the federal response where oftentimes the federal response trickles down and affects communities nationwide. Now, COVID-19 has uh, spawned a few different actions. In particular, there was increased funding on the federal level for the mental health block grant, the substance abuse prevention treatment block grant, as well as some new funding. Most recently, the mobile crisis response uh, funding opportunity through CMS. We also received treatment flexibilities for substance use, including take-home doses for opioid use disorder uh, medications. Now, there was, of course, the need for increased coordination um, through different sectors, public health, mental health, substance use, as well as educational systems. And of course, the importance of surveillance and investments in new surveillance, whether it's through the existing uh, CDC morbidity mortality weekly report, uh, as well as the provisional mortality data for substance use deaths or suicide. There's the new COVID experience or COVEX panels from CDC. And of course, SAMHSA's National Survey on Drug Use and Health. Let me go to the next slide. Now, of course, this community is faced with a number of opportunities and challenges. Top of mind for a lot of county-based behavioral health authorities is 980 implementation. As a quick background, Congress passed the National Suicide Hotline Designation Act of 2020, which designated 988 as a national suicide prevention and mental health crisis hotline. This, this bill also allows states to levy fees to fund the switch, but it has been a patchwork with some states implementing user fees quickly, others uh, implementing their own 988 laws without it, and others not acting quite yet. Also notice how it's not only a suicide prevention line, but a mental health crisis line, which can include symptoms exhibited by some substances with, and with the hope of replacing or supplementing law enforcement responses. Now, 988 is set to go live in July 2022. And CMS, I just mentioned, announced a funding opportunity for mobile crisis response, but it's only one part of the continuum that includes call centers, stabilization centers, treatment, recovery, and prevention, let alone coordination with public safety and 911 call centers. I also mentioned earlier, but I, I bears repeating, there's an opportunity to expand the whole continuum of care and connect the various systems that they are often located in. From prevention, early intervention, treatment, and recovery, this requires connections between the systems involved, education, public health, behavioral health, housing, public safety, social services, agent authorities, and others. And of course, bears repeating, county-based behavioral system, health systems strive to increase this coordination. But the dirty secret is this work cannot be done without funding. Our brothers, sisters, and non-binary friends in public health know all too well the boom and bust cycle of funding where it's allocated in response to a threat, but cut over time as the danger subsides. Now the behavioral health system is a little different, but it is critical that we avoid this dynamic. And lastly, workforce. Much has been said about the burnout of medical professionals and many of the same dynamics have existed in behavioral and the behavioral health workforce for years. But there are some unique opportunities as well, like peer support specialists or developing recruiting pipelines, leveraging local community colleges or job training programs, 
where we can utilize the lived experiences of those in recovery and members of the community to help those in treatment or seeking it. Now, I know I threw a lot at you where we talked about the background of the two organizations I run. We talked about the seven Ps and the role of counties. We talked about the federal response to COVID and how that trickles down and impacts counties. And of course, future opportunities and challenges. But I encourage you, if you have any questions or want to learn more, please visit our websites at nagbid.org or nanarm.org, or you can email me at jcunningham at nacbid with one d.org. Thank you, and I look forward to, uh, to the conversation. Well, thank you, Jonah, for your video, and thank you for joining us in person. We very much appreciate it. Sorry about being out of order. I also really want to thank Mary and uh, AJ and um, of course, Jonah again. And we've heard as we went through their presentations and Eric's, of course, um, we heard about a number of things happening on the federal level. And I just wanted to take a, a minute to mention that these same types of bills are coming up on the state's level. And it's really important that we do advocacy in the states on 988. Every state needs an implementation act. It's They're all gonna look a little bit different. Some of them have done it. Some of them have done it with funding from the state, pulling down federal dollars. Some of them have enacted a small fee that goes on phone bills. There's, good, there's a lot of reasons why it has to happen at the local level. We know that when 988 becomes live, it's going to be more than just the a suicide hotline number. It calls will be diverted from 911. People will be calling in other kinds of extreme distress and they need to be connected to local services, local mental health response. We're going to be also hearing, and we heard Mary talk about this, and we know that it's really important about parity. Parity is really an equity and civil rights issue when it comes to mental health coverage. And we know that states are shoring up the federal mental health parity and equity addiction act, MAPIA, been around for over 12 years now. And we will have links to a report about how parity is not happening in the states but it must. So pay attention to what your state is doing to shore up parity compliance in uh, your locality. Another area of legislation we'll be hearing a lot about is access to treatment and access to care. Medicaid expansion, Mary touched on that. It's extraordinarily important that we get insurance coverage for all citizens. But another piece that really impacts that is access to one of the important tools, which is medication access. And a lot of states are looking at ways to cut their state expenditures. That's penny wise and pound foolish. One of the um, pieces of um, one of the uh, sheets, the fact sheets that you'll be able to download is a wonderful report, in fact, called that Pennywise and Pound Foolish as to why limited access to medication, fail first, really is not a good fiscal answer to saving monies for the states. We know that continuity of care is so important. So we'll be seeing bills that are anti-fail first and, and pro-continuity of care. Um, we also heard from governors and from Mary about telehealth and the expansion. Well, we need to keep those expansions permanent. Yes, there's federal legislation, but things also happening on the state's level. So there's a lot that we'll be hearing about, but we're going to go now to an amazing conversation between our regional policy representatives. You'll see why we uh, love them so much. And I know that our affiliates know them well, and then they will be joining us 
for a live Q&A. So get your questions ready in the chat and they'll all be here. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. You've been hearing about the wonderful things that our Regional Policy Council does, and, um, such as giving awards and all the things in the counties and all the wonderful things with our affiliates and their cluster calls. And I'm sure most of you know our Regional Policy Council representatives, but it's always my pleasure to introduce them. So I'm gonna introduce them in the order that I see them on my Zoom screen. We've got Bar Barb Johnston from New Jersey. And um, Barb has most of the states in the Eastern region. And then I'm gonna to move to Mo Keller, who um, is from our Mental Health Colorado. And um, Mo's cluster is the, most of the Western states. Um, I'm gonna to move to the top of my screen and introduce Shana Mogahel, whose cluster is um, the middle of the country. And Shana is from our MHA of Minnesota. And last but certainly not least is Ben Harrington. And uh, Ben is from our MHA of East Tennessee. And Ben's states run pretty much across the South. So I know that our affiliates hear from our RPC reps um, very often, but uh, what other folks who are joining us for the first time may not know is that they're some of the most respected and in-depth policy people when it comes to behavioral health across the country. So we're going to be hearing brief presentations from each of them, and we're going to start with Ben, and Ben's going to to tell about a county needs as how to do needs assessment, how he did it in the county where his MHA is, and how that can be applied to um, other places across the country. We're then going to hear, well, what goes into a needs assessment? You've got to have some really important data. And Barb's going to tell us about some, some ways that they have collected data and how to talk to legislators about what she has found. And she'll go into a few minutes about that. Mo is going to talk about how do you get things done? How do you get changes done? Well, in Colorado, where Mo's from, they're able to have some ballot initiatives. Not every state does, but many do. And how Colorado has done regional ballot initiatives. And finally, we're going to hear from Shana, and she's going to show us how the data that her NHA has collected on the amazing programs that they do, how that is being used by counties um, all across the state of Minnesota. So let's start with Ben. Ben? Well, thank you, Debbie. Appreciate the opportunity to talk about an exciting project here in uh, Knox County, Tennessee, which is on the eastern end of the state of Tennessee. So we've been uh, contracted uh, by Knox County government to conduct a uh, needs assessment and gap analysis of the mental health needs of our community. And the reason for that is the county hears from lots of different people, whether it's providers, hospitals, uh, service recipients having trouble finding uh, a place for, for themselves or their loved one, that sort of thing, uh, folks that serve homeless, uh, et cetera. So they're hearing from lots of different folks, but they were unsure um, about the accuracy of all the, the issues that were being raised or the accuracy of data, because everyone said, oh, our, our problem is the most important thing to work on. So they asked us to uh, conduct a gap analysis and try to figure out um, where we stand, what we have, what we don't have, and what we certainly need. So our process has started with um, identifying a uh, robust list of key informants and stakeholders that we wanted to um, survey. So we created a survey instrument and disseminated that and have been uh, collecting the responses to the survey. The next phrase of that was to actually take all the information and decide who we needed to go back to uh, to determine what additional detail we needed to collect to support the uh, issue they raised in the, the key informant survey. 
And along the way there, also collect uh, key data points that could um, support the need that's been identified, uh, validate um, the uh, distinct need that we needed to fill in the future in terms of um, what we needed, as well as you know, numbers of persons that would be able to use certain services, that sort of thing. So we're in the, the data collection phase right now and uh, trying to figure out what it will, will tell us with regards to access, the behavioral health workforce shortage, um, hospital services, crisis services, uh, every area of uh, our mental health uh, service continuum is being addressed here in this needs assessment survey. And we hope to wrap things up um, in March with a uh, printed report for Knox County government and elected officials so that then the government officials can determine what they wanna work on, whether it's low lying fruit or higher hanging fruit, that's gonna cost a lot more um, in terms of investment. Uh, but that's the beauty of this project. We get to uh, recommend what needs to be done and show them some avenues to address uh, those needs. Hi all, I'm Barb Johnston. It's good to be with you today. I was asked to talk a little bit about how we use data to really inform our various audiences about the importance of access to services. So every few years we conduct a survey using our very adept call center staff and they for us identified who the key outpatient service providers were throughout the state. Um, they on a regular basis provide information, referral counseling to individuals um, so that they may access treatment. Um, we then developed a questionnaire to uh, standardize the questions and approaches. We did not conduct this as a secret shopper. Um, but we did ask our staff to explain the rationale to the people who answered the phone, who most of the time are intake individuals, and explain the rationale that we really want to have a good understanding of where the wait times are, how our people, our callers can get appointments, and to ensure that resources come their way when necessary. So we've had very, very good cooperation on these studies. Um, we assigned the staff uh, counties, and currently we're updating this survey, um, and it is over a three-week period of time. Um, just, you know, kudos to the staff that does the polling. We had weekly calls to iron out the issues, and we made sure that data was submitted weekly so that we knew that it was coming in accurately and completely. Um, these are some of the uh, findings as how we present them in previous years. So we do county breakdowns and we're able to compare previous year to current year. This is really important for individuals to understand whether we're progressing, what the counties look like and where the key problems are. So we broke it into regions and then in counties. And I'll tell you why that's so important in a minute. We also were able to identify the top behavioral health issues in our counties, long waits, housing, because all of this came through our center as the calls were being made as well. So again, very important uh, data that we're able to share. I'll tell you how we used our findings. Uh, first of all, the call center, it's a win-win. Uh, they're able to update all of their records, not just on a, um, on a needed basis as they make the calls, but here they have a full recording of what the actual current appointments are for each particular uh, agency and service provider. Um, we definitely put these charts into our budget testimony. And when I do testify, it is all ears. Then we follow it up with legislators about their individual districts and what's going on there. And they're very interested to get that information. We first, before we do any of this, present the data to our administration, to commissioners, and then to policymakers. So we, we have very good um, uptake on it. We have very good uh, cooperation um, on compliance with, this, with the surveys themselves, and we're really happy with how this data gets used. And it's become, as I said, a survey that we've done now four or five times for our state. So thank you. 
So here in Colorado, we had a number of county efforts to improve mental health services by raising revenue and going to the voters to ask for this increased revenue to be used for mental health. And uh, you can see this is our map of the, of the state. We and uh, our managed care program for Medicaid, we have five regions, geographic regions. So they're not broken up by county as they are in some other states. This is regional. And you can see how large these regions are. Uh, and so uh, many of our counties, particularly the rural counties of our state, were feeling that they, and frankly, it was true, they were not getting services. So uh, they were uh, either had very limitation, a lot of limitation on services, or they were uh, not getting services at all. So the rural counties started to look at breaking away and forming their own mental health and substance use uh, programs and, and centers uh, specifically for their county. We had several counties that actually came to us as Mental Health Colorado because we are an advocacy driven uh, nonprofit and they asked us uh, for some assistance, which we did provide. Uh, I can state that um, as a 501c3 nonprofit, we cannot endorse candidates and we cannot uh, work on candidate campaigns, but we can work on advocacy and we can work on ballot initiatives. And that's, as, that's what we did. So these were the things that we did to help the counties pass their initiatives with the voters. We helped with collecting ballot signatures. So all of us as staff who felt comfortable doing that, uh, got our clipboard with our list and out we went to the food trucks downtown and up and down Broadway and went over to uh, the people waiting in line to go to the museum and wherever we found people, we asked them to sign uh, to, to, to uh, permit this citizen initiative for raising revenues to increase mental health services to get on the ballot. We did a campaign kickoff uh, for one of the counties in our office. Uh, we provided phone banking uh, on another afternoon. Uh, all of the staff got um, a list of uh, voters uh, registered voters from that particular county and their phone numbers, and we called and we said, this is on the, um, the ballot, please vote for it. This is what it will do. We answered questions, uh, but we, we provided that uh, effort as well. We held a press event, we engaged our volunteer base, and we did a lot of interviews on local radio for that county and local TV for that county. We did public service announcements. Uh, so all of these things, um, were things that we uh, provided for these five counties to be able to um, raise revenues. And I can say all five counties were successful in raising revenues. Uh, every one of them got a yes at the ballot, Some two of them with 73% of the vote. So if it's done right, you've got to do your planning, you've got to do your buy-in, you have to make sure that all of the stakeholders and, and make your stakeholder list very broad because mental health affects everywhere and everyone. So grab everybody and make sure that everyone um, who is a stakeholder receives something from the revenue generated. That's how you build your coalition base. Polling is very important. Some counties decided to go to a mill levy increase on property tax. Others did sales taxes on marijuana revenue. Another county did sales taxes on everything. And so your polling helps you to decide um, uh, you know, what, how your citizens are feeling about each one of those options for which you have a better success of passage rate. So again, this is all data that, that uh, um, uh, comes in here. So I'm gonna go through the five counties. Those, that was the five. And you'll be able to see this um, because these uh, slides will be available. At the end of all of that, this was a very active time. It was 2017 and 2018. Uh, but you'll see here what we did is we got a, uh, some funds from the Denver Foundation to compile a summary. Uh, so Mental Health Colorado put this together. These were the five ballot initiatives. And there's a ton of not only data, but information here about um, how you can uh, use this uh, data and information to convince your public, not only you know, to pass the initiative, but then you have to show them what it is you did with the funding. So for here in uh, Caring for Denver actually uh, passed with 73% of the vote. What you'll notice in that one circle, as of August 27th, nine and a half, 9.2 million dollars 
had already been given out in grants to do different programs and the grants are listed in this report as well. So it's always important to keep your data uh, and present that to uh, the general public so that they know they did a good thing when they uh, passed the uh, ballot initiative. So um, this is uh, uh, one way that county affiliates can actually engage and help with um, um, the um, individuals. Hi, everyone. Um, so I'm going to speak just briefly about um, a way that we have worked with a county to develop um, a dashboard of services, as well as how we've gained some financial support uh, from them as well. Uh, and so, um, you know, what we've really been able to do is develop a true partnership with one of our counties. Um, our big interest is in developing a more upstream approach to mental health services. And that's a big part of what, you know, all of our services and programs here at Mental Health Minnesota are all about. And so this work has allowed us to um, both partner with the county to pull together a behavioral health dashboard, as well as gain some financial support for our services. Uh, this began with uh, support coming from Dakota County uh, from the CARES Act money that had come into the state, uh, specifically to support our warm line service. Uh, we were able to obtain that mostly because of a lot of the data that we collect. So um, one of the pieces that we ask our callers is what they would do if they couldn't reach us. And one in four um, people who call our warm line say that if they couldn't reach our warm line, they're calling EMS, they're calling crisis, or they're going to an emergency department. Um, we took about 15,000 calls in 2021. And Dakota County is the third highest utilizer of those services, um, using about 9% of all calls. So that's more than 1,300 calls we took to the warm line um, last year. And if one in four of those went to EMS crisis or an emergency department, that's about 350 calls or visits um, that we were able to help avoid. So the impact on counties, um, of course, in that arena is mostly through EMS or law enforcement use, as well as county crisis services. Um, but in Minnesota, counties are also financially responsible for the cost of care at state hospitals if a person no longer needs hospital level of care, but there's not a place for them to go in their county related to step down services. Um, that cost is about $1,400 a day. So obviously that adds up very quickly. Um, so it's certainly in, you know, the county's best financial interest to avoid use of crisis services, EMS, hospitalization, by providing that ongoing support to people living with mental illness. So by tracking the data by county, um, as well as data around um, who is utilizing Medicaid or Medicare services, um, we've now been able to transition from CARES Act money to actual county funds to support the warm line service. Um, we also started sharing um, online screening numbers with the county um, in the last year, uh, really focusing on the need to have more people screen early um, and really avoid mental health crisis wherever possible. And so the county now has, um, as part of their overall dashboard, and you can see the sources is Mental Health Minnesota on this, um, and this is just a screenshot, um, that has all of our screening data on it that's both general as well as uh, county specific. And so um, I don't know if you can see on the very end, kind of looks like you can't, but this will, this will be um, sent out that you can see the, the individual county data as well as the overall screening data and the big increases that we've seen. So some of the funding that the county is currently providing to us can now go, go toward promoting online screenings because they, they've seen their numbers go up and they've really seen the impact of be, taking a more upstream approach to mental health. <clears throat> so the keys to success for us in this have really been about good data um, that can be narrowed down by county, um, a solid case statement related to kind of more specifically to cost avoidance um, that's county specific, and then relationships that we've you know, that I've been able to build through, through public policy work and, and community meetings and other things um, with, um, with this county in particular and, and a number of others we're working on proposals with too, that has really built trust in us as a partner in this work. 
I think one of the challenges for, for my organization is we're statewide. There are 87 counties in Minnesota, so it's kind of chipping off one at a time. But this has been a, a good example of a way that we can use our data to really build support and success for more upstream initiatives. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, everybody. Everybody is going to join us for live Q&A. So we're going to switch over to uh, answering your questions. And thank you, Ben. Thank you, Shana. Thank you, Mel. Thank you, Barb. Everybody with us? I know Ben was having a little trouble. We'll have Ben with us in a minute. I see Shana. I see Mo. Barb, are you with us? I'm going to start. I am, but I can't turn on my video. Am I supposed to? Yes, please. We want to I'm see you. It, uh, <laughs> it says I'm out. Oh, there we go. Hello. Oh, the, host, the host has stopped my video. Oh, here we are. Your presentations, as always, are amazing. And there was so much information in there, um, as always. But you all hit on the really important points about showing, not just telling. But after you've shown it, what it is that we need and what it is that people in the communities want, then taking that action. Um, I, I have noticed as I'm reflecting on your presentations, how important it is um, to collect data every single step of the way. And one of the things we've talked about, and we've talked about this a lot over our last few meetings, and we'll of course uh, keep talking about it, is how to deflect people out of the criminal justice system. And Shanna hit, uh, hit on some really, really important points about how many calls don't go to police, how many calls don't go to EMS. And that's an important piece of data that we're going to need as 988 comes up and we do more in the realm of deflecting folks out of the criminal justice system. Anybody wanna talk about how we can collect data on what it is we're not seeing? Well, I, I'm, I'm happy to jump in and start, Debbie, um, since you, you noted that I had, had spoken about this briefly in my presentation. Um, I think I would just note, you know, part of the way that, that I started looking at this was, you know, a lot of times, I think particularly in the, in the mental health sector and, and in the direct service arena, we really look at, at outcomes and outputs of what we're doing. And instead, I chose to take a kind of flip it around and say, what's the cost if we're not not doing the work. Um, and, and I think that that demands a, a shift in thinking, uh, because we like to think we can serve everyone, right? And that's just, it's just not realistic without the appropriate resources to do so. And so my hand was kind of forced, frankly, by some um, eliminations of some funding, which really needed, meant I needed to look at some different options for how to really demonstrate um, what we were doing. And so, you know, what we really started looking at is what are the data points that would make a difference, right? And so for us, it was about that cost avoidance. Um, and really, what do people do if they can't reach us? What do people do if they can't get access to an appointment within two weeks? What do people, you know, I think, I think turning some of that on its head is going to be important for all of us as we look at um, really building support for um, some of these initiatives, you know, like 988, what happens if someone can't reach 988 in your state and they get sent out somewhere else? Suddenly they're out of the loop in terms of services that you have within your state. You know, what are the, what are the repercussions and the consequences of that? Not just the, the human ones, but the financial ones as well. So I think it just demands all of us to really think about what we do a little bit differently um, and really look at what happens if we would if we can't do any of the work that we do now because there's not enough resources to do it? What happens and what are the real costs? Thank you, Shana. Um, it's it's so important to look at that. One of the other areas, and please, any of you feel free to address this. One of the other things that is really important here that we don't often see, and it's a little bit hard to tie the data together, um, is. Uh, issues of social determinants, whether or not, you know, how, how many folks are, are homeless and unhoused and how providing services in a timely manner is going to 
save money in that arena as well. Anybody feel free to jump in. We partner with a lot of other nonprofit organizations who have data. So I don't want anyone to think you have to create the data or you have to reinvent the wheel. Um, our Colorado Coalition for the Homeless has extensive data on the, that particular population. So I will pull that in uh, and then I will look at that along with uh, some other nonprofits, our peer association. We have a, a peer nonprofit. They have some data on, on that aspect. So I pull all that in and then I've got enough to work with to start looking at how do we either engage at the state level on legislation using this data or how do we assist a county? Um, uh, because in our state, while the um, in, in Colorado, while the state funds a lot of the programs, the actual delivery system is at the county level. And I think we're missing the boat if we don't work actively with our school boards and with our county commissioners, some of our mayors, uh, law enforcement at the county level. Uh, to put all this data together and, and, and work with everyone on how best to uh, meet the needs of the community in question. And it does look different county by county. Thank you, Matt. Uh, just, Deb, just to, yeah, support, ahead, um, just to support the idea of social determinants, um, beyond data collection, we know that it's impossible for individuals to re really move forward with their recovery if they really don't have a lot of these key pieces in place. And what we're seeing a lot of around here at the provider level actually is these medical legal partnerships where there is a real connection to helping people to resolve these social determinant issues right there on the spot, along with all of their other recovery services. So we are seeing that as a trend. Thank you, Barb. Um, ben has joined us. Hi, Ben, glad that you're here. Actually, I wanna pat you on the back with the next question. You talked about in your uh, presentation, the needs assessment. Um, and I would like you to talk a little bit about how you were able to get some funding for that needs assessment and who are all the partners you're talking to? That same thing yeah. that Mo talked about, connecting with your community partners. Right, right. So we don't have enough time to list all the partners, okay? But, <laughs> no, no, so, no, don't list them all. <laughs> yeah. So the, the how it came about is, you know, lots of different stakeholders all uh, provide lots of chatter to elected officials, whether they're uh, county commissioners, city council members, mayors, et cetera, and they all say, hey, my issue is the biggest issue. Well, there's lots of different stakeholders. So those elected officials are, you know, sort of, um, you know, got swivel head uh, going because they don't know which one to pay attention to. And so they, they started to have a conversation about, we need to try to figure out what the issues are and how do we know that they're real issues. And, you know, so they asked us, you know, would you be willing to consider being our go-between with all these stakeholders. Well, the beauty of it is we already know all the stakeholders and have relationships, and we already are, you know, just like Switzerland, extremely neutral because we're not a clinical provider, we're not a homeless provider, we're not doing behavioral health services at, uh, in school or in schools, we're not doing addiction services. So we've got lots of ability to network with all these different. Um, stakeholders, whether they be mental health centers, hospitals, homeless services, the sheriff, um, schools, uh, the faith-based community, et cetera, and the ability to hear their concerns, tell them when to stop, right, and say, okay, great issue, but now let's talk about the data that needs to support that issue. We've got to elevate that issue before these elected officials. So how do we do that? And that then allows dialogue to uh, proceed about, well, this is where that data is, let's produce it. And a lot of individual entities are sharing proprietary data um, in this process, which is, is great. Um, the scary stuff that we're seeing is, you know, we know how much um, during the pandemic mental health needs of every community, you know, just increased uh, dramatically. But at the same time, we're seeing that huge surge in demand. We're seeing a high, high increase in 
uh, turnover of staff. So that's really um, highlighting both the needs of our public to seek and enter treatment, but also the limitations of the public sector because their turnover ratio has uh, doubled uh, during the pandemic. And so that creates distinct problems. So um, lots of stakeholders trying to clear out what's the chatter with uh, all the stakeholders and get facts and data to support their needs. Thank you, Ben. You know, one of the pieces of data, and, and we saw Shanna using this in, in her dashboard, of course, is the screening and what we're seeing, which relates, you know, right to COVID and the amazing, oh my gosh, overwhelming increase in need that we're seeing, plus the lowering of workforce. Are you able to uh, use uh, MHA data in your advocacy, yes. in your data that you're presenting to your counties? How's that fitting in there for you? Please, anybody jump in. Well, I, I can answer that right away. We used that early data in 2020 to leverage uh, significant state investment in uh, the screening program here in Tennessee, and that benefits both the MHA of Mid-South as well as the MHA of East Tennessee. Um, but that all, uh, has also helped to drive some of this conversation locally with the county uh, government and other elected officials, because that, that's real uh, boots on the ground stuff. You know, this is, this is what's going on right now. And so they're able to see, wow, this, this really demonstrates what they're saying anecdotally about a surge of people needing help. Well, this proves the, the, the large increase of people needing help. And we can drill down that data specifically to Knox County, Tennessee too. Exactly. And Debbie, I would, I would jump in too on that piece then. And just note, you know, we've, we've used our data and from screenings in so many different ways. Um, and the dashboard that I shared was, was one example of how we've been sharing that, that more county specific data, but you know, I talk about it in meetings with insurance companies. I talk about it in meetings with legislators as this is a crystal ball moment for us, right? If all these people are taking screenings, we can see the wave that's coming, right? So let's use that. And so I use the data when I talk about things a lot in the public policy space. You know, when we talk about the need for investment in 988, that's, that's huge because that's a, that's a first call for help, right? When people are probably not reaching out to anything else, that we need that investment. I talk about it when we talk about workforce needs. If we have all these people coming into the pipeline and we don't have the workforce to serve them, that's a big concern. And so that helps us make that case as well for some specific things that we can do around building our workforce too. Hey, Debbie, there's another point to, to be made there. You know, okay. in our community, it's not unlike so many others, where they, the person who needs mental health care typically accesses care for the first time is at the crisis points, whether it's emergency room, hospitalization, crisis services, that sort of thing. So the screening utilization really allows us to point to that greater need. We need to push services upstream so that folks who are reaching out, taking a screening first, or calling Shanna's warm line can access far upstream rather than wait to get to a much more costly or level of, of unit of service entering at, at a crisis point. Absolutely. We have, we have a question that I think is really important and Ben touched on, on the issue a little bit and that's workforce. I mean, so here we are and we're advocating for um, more uh, funding for sure. We're bringing data about the need. How are you able to um, affect in, in some way or what do you see some of the solutions for the fact that we have documented and we continue to document the need, but workforce continues to really be a challenge? So I'd, I'd like to begin that one. Uh, the um, Mental Health Colorado, we are introducing a bill that is called Supports for Independent Medicaid Mental Health Providers. We've been hearing from them that there are a lot of barriers to take Medicaid and we shouldn't be presenting barriers. We, you know, we should be encouraging people to stay within Medicaid and they're dropping out. And so that's a, a, a retention issue 
that is an immediate concern because they're already there. You know, they're not, we don't have to wait four years for them to come through the pipeline. They're already out there working. They're certified, they're uh, credentialed to accept Medicaid billing and to provide billing. Um, and yet they're dropping out in paperwork, excessive amounts of paperwork, um, uh, recoupment um, often is, a, is an issue, credentialing times are an issue, uh, and the low pay. And so we're, we're going to have several bills this legislative session, and we have the cooperation of our Medicaid uh, director and, and a lot of legislators who see this piece. Uh, so that's, that's one piece. So we're, we're hoping to address by getting more pay and less paperwork uh, for individuals that are, are providers already there to retain them. We're also looking at some things about um, graduate students who are being interned, how we can better use those folks and have the preceptors get a tax credit for providing for the uh, internship. Uh, also, um, potentially paying for that internship for that uh, 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 graduate student to be able to uh, intern. And we're looking at a few other things in the rural areas about trying to get uh, youth at the high schools, uh, at high school level in the rural areas to want to stay there because they it's their community and they often do. So how do we encourage them to, pro to provide classes where they are so that they can stay in, in that community because they're more likely to stay. Some of the data that I have seen around uh, loan forgiveness, when someone is willing to go to a local community that's a rural community and, and uh, they stay for as long as that loan forgiveness and then they're gone, uh, doesn't appear, loan forgiveness doesn't appear to help retain individuals in those communities from what we're, we're starting to gather. Um, but the retention issue and uh, the um, uh, graduate level use of interns is uh, two things that we're looking at. Great. Barb, you wanted to, to address this? Yeah, so we are you know, certainly seeing all of those uh, concerns right here in our state. Um, we, we know that people are, many of them are pulled to telehealth and leaving community agencies also, which is an issue. Um, that our whole state is working on and aware of. One unique program that we've created is to add uh, state dollars to in, uh, expand the residence, psychiatric residence slots in our state. We've added 10 new residents and uh, we're hoping that this will continue. So this is paid for for four years for the duration of their uh, residency programs. And they're all required to do community rotations to familiarize them and get them uh, really accustomed to working in community psychiatry. And uh, we're working with our partners and the Psychiatric Association to really survey people and see how they can stay in our state also as well when they complete these residencies. And we're hoping that this program is annualized in the upcoming years. We do think this will clearly help us address the psychiatric shortage. Anybody else address that issue? Yeah, I would just... Go ahead, Sharon. Oh, sorry, Ben. Um, I would just note one additional thing, because I, I, you know, we're doing a lot of the same things that were mentioned, so I won't repeat them here. Certainly, reimbursement rates continue to be a, a big challenge, you know, in this arena as well, and is very closely tied to being able to um, to pay people what they're worth. Um, Another thing that we are uh, working on in Minnesota is the supervision piece for, for people who are newly in their career. We have seen a, a very large number of um, new graduates of master's programs not actually ever end up practicing or getting licensed. Um, and so, you know, really started to look at what are the barriers here, you know, um, and part of it is, is the pay going into the field, although a lot of people kind of know that going in, you know, you're not going to make make bank working in mental health. Um, but um, the the fact that you have to pay for supervision um, as you work on getting that license and you're still at the bottom of the of the pay scale um, is very difficult and a real challenge for for people. And so we are looking at options to be able to uh, fund clinics so that they can pay for supervision for their new staff so that that's not an additional cost for that person to take on. 
um, and just trying to make supervision easier, whether or not that's adding more options that you don't have to do it in person as much, you know, pieces around that to try to ease some of that to keep people in the field when they first start. I would like to jump in with, with one of the biggest areas of workforce that we think can really make a difference, and that's peer specialists. Um, we know that there are um, lots of folks who have been trained, um, just like Shana was mentioning, master's level folks who don't get licensed. Um, many of our peer certified peer specialists um, are underemployed or unemployed. And uh, what a difference they'll be able to make at really every level of care but especially in all of the need that's unfolding in crisis care with 988. So we know that peers are going to play an incredible role in answering phones, be it a warm line like Shauna and Ben have it, their affiliates, uh, be it um, going out on mobile teams. Peers are an amazing part of mobile teams, whether that's with a co-responder team, if law enforcement is still used, as it is in many areas, in many rural areas, and peer-run respite as another uh, example of a community resource that's very inexpensive to put in place. So stabilization centers sometimes um, are pretty fancy and take some time to build and some time to get the funding for, but a peer run respite, um, it could be as simple as converting an existing house and making sure that it's uh, ADA compliant. And then that gives people an opportunity to stay a little bit longer than they might a few more days longer than they might at a stabilization center or if one doesn't exist. So we know that peers are going to be a really important uh, part of expanding workforce. Um, anybody else want to add anything to, to workforce? Yeah. Ben, you wanted to say yeah. something there? Yeah, real quick. I wanted to uh, give a shout out. First of all, Minnesota did a fantastic study on their workforce shortage and made a great report to the state and, and uh, mental health uh, uh, Minnesota was involved. That's a great tool to, to look at in other states. And we used it here in Tennessee recently. But so there are multiple strategies and usually the feds have some strategies. Maybe a state might have a strategy with regards to loan forgiveness and stuff like that. But I, I think it's important to um, take all those things and try to double down, if you will. And you know, we're in the midst of this county project, and they're asking for uh, the MHA here to recommend county-specific solutions to some issues. And so, with workforce, our first uh, piece of communication with the county is going to be, you know, it, it does take a village, and we just can't say. Uh, state reimbursements for Medicaid delivered services are going to be uh, just solely the uh, purview of the federal government and, and the state. We know there are other programs and services that are, are funded, uh, and they're all not funded 100%. So we need local sources to uh, support and raise up the level of reimbursement for services so that you know it, it can be done appropriately and and um, we're paying folks the, the right level uh, of reimbursement. But doubling down on that, if there's a uh, state stipend to re, uh, uh, do a sign-on bonus, why can't the county create their own fund to do that? Double down. If there's a uh, state-funded pool for retention bonus, why can't the county do the same thing? And if there's uh, a need like we've identified in Knox County, we have very few uh, black uh, uh, mental health professionals and uh, like one that speaks Spanish. Well, that's a need. If the community needs that, now let's really put some resources together that are county specific and double down. How do we recruit black professionals, Spanish speaking professionals to address that specific need in our community? that's not being addressed and won't be if we just lean on the usual uh, programs to try to recruit folks. 
That's a great point, Ben. You've really, you know, tied together how we can look at things, you know, on the federal level, we know there's more funding coming. Um, and hopefully, as part of um, Build Back Better, and some other pieces of federal legislation, maybe some loan forgiveness, as Shana mentioned, um, that would make a, a big difference for folks getting trained, more uh, slots for people. Uh, more monies in the block grant, more action at every single one of our levels. Would anybody like to offer any other thoughts about how to address the federal, the state, the county, the local, the consortium of counties? Anybody else want to add anything? Well, you certainly have done a wonderful job in speaking to all of those areas. I really thank our regional policy representatives. You can see why we, um, you know, when we say they're some of the best policy minds across the country, it's not hyperbole. We really mean it. So thank you to Ben and Shauna and Mo and Barb. Um, and again, thank you to our industry partners that make regional policy council meetings possible. Al Kermis, Jansen, Myriad, Nurekrin, Otska, Pfizer, Sage, Takeda, Lundback, and Teva. And I want to give an extra shout out to our behind the scenes mental health America staff who are helping us. Um, <clears throat> Kareem King is behind the scenes making things work. Um, we have a um, consultant, Amanda Adams Barney, who has been helping us collate all our videos and run the videos today. A special thank you to Karen Howard, who has been putting together all the pieces and registration and all of that good stuff. And boy, Kat Reynolds, you have done a wonderful job with chat today. So um, we're gonna be showing you a slide about what's coming up um, in March when we do um, a, a virtual Hill Day in March and for uh, MHA affiliates who will be able to come into Washington um, and our affiliates all across the country. We can help set up meetings. There's a little bit more information about that on your screen. And we really are looking forward to being able to be in person again. We think this summer we'll be able to do so. We'll be in, in Moe's home area of Denver in August. Um, we'll be in uh, December in Hawaii. And we've got one more meeting to be announced, both time and location. And we hope you'll be able to join us then. So thank you again to all our attendees, to our regional policy representatives, to MHA staff, and to our industry partners. Take care, everybody.